Yeah, well, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from uh, Alabama. <laughs> and I'm actually, I'm London from England. And I have a weird background in that I began my career as a comedian and voiceover, and that's kind of what I still do now. But around about 20 years ago, I started, we were trying to raise the money for a project and there were all these very clever people talking on the internet and I was trying to work out a, a means to talk to them to find out how to make the money that we needed for this project. This was a musical. We needed like five million pounds, which would have been $10 million at the time to, to bring it into the West End. So I started a podcast <laughs> really? as a means to talk to them so I wouldn't have to pay them for their time. And I found everyone's very willing to come on podcasts. They certainly were on those days because there weren't as many and people quite happy to promote their own little brand and so on. And so the very first podcast I did was interviewing Jim Rogers. So talk about diving in at the deep oh, end. Oh, wow, sure. Mm -hmm. And then it was people like James Turk and Jim Dines. And and this is, as I say, in the mid noughties And I became convinced that the place to put money was gold and commodities. And as a result of investing in gold, I started reading about money and how fiat money works and how money is created and how fiat money is evil and limited government and how gold puts a, a restraint on government and is gold is the way by which the citizen can hold the government to account and all that stuff. And for the first time in my life, I became interested in politics and I became a rabid libertarian. And I've since authored the Libertarian National Anthem, which I'm very proud of. And one of the people I interviewed was a lady called Merrin Somerset Webb, who was a editor of a magazine called Money Week. And she said, oh, we need people to come and, like you to come and write for us. And suddenly before I knew it, I was a financial writer. And I said, I don't really know what I'm talking about. And she said, that doesn't matter. <laughs> and I've since discovered that it doesn't. So that's the sort of roundabout route of, and so uh, now I'm sort of financial writer and comedian. And that's how I ended up where I am. Well, there's, well, great. Yeah, there's um a c couple similarities in our respective stories because, yeah, I, uh, I started out my career as I was going to be a college professor teaching economics in the classroom. And I wouldn't have dreamed of like speaking to real people about money and the, you know, the stock market and stuff like that, because I just thought, oh, there's so many moving parts and who could, and what got me over that reticence was not that I became more confident in my abilities. It's that I saw everybody else who was talking to the public about the stock market and realized, well, I can at least give them better information than these clowns can. So that was uh, well, sort of what happened. There's a, a brilliant book written about Hollywood by William Goldman, who is a fantastic writer, wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance mm -hmm. Kid and various other films, All the President's Men. And one of the phrases that you take away from his book is, nobody knows anything. And he's just said that's when it comes to films and the entertainment industry, you just don't know what's going to work and what isn't. Obviously, mm -hmm. you can make educated guesses and use good people and all the rest of it. But ultimately, nobody knows anything. And the same applies to finance. The same applies to everything. Yeah, Nobody I think... Uh, knows anything. I think it was Dick Clark who told Bobby Darren when Bobby Darren was going to do the song Mac the Knife. And he told him, what are you doing? That's like not at all like the other, you know, fun songs you've been doing. It's not going to be a big... And of course, it was like, you know, his biggest hit of all time. Yeah, I mean, that's happened time and time again. So if you were a, if you were a commissioner, a TV commissioner in 2008, and you went, right, I'm going to commission two-minute cat videos. That's what I'm going to commission. Just people, just random people showing their cats. You would have just gone, are you mad? And yet, I think those are the most watched videos in the world. Yeah, yeah. And maybe how-to videos it might be slightly more watched as a group, uh -huh. but singularly cat videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, too, if somebody had described how Twitter works. Like, let's make it so you can't type very much at a time and everyone's yeah. just going to flock there to communicate with each other where we're like, we're deliberately handcuffing you. I would have thought that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of it yet. Yeah, but Twitch has done this new thing where you can write longer posts. Well, they've and, evolved, yes. And I've kind of, I'm like, oh, God. Because you start reading a post, you go, oh, that's interesting. And then you, you click on it and then it's got like some long essay and you're like, I haven't got time for that. Right, you right. Just want the, you just want the short... Yeah. Pithy, argumentative stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what made Twitter so great in the first place? Yeah. So anyway. I see hanging behind you, you're, you know, you were talking about gold, but you've also now got posters about Bitcoin. So did, did you take the plunge into, into that? 
I wrote the first book on Bitcoin in 2013, 14 from a proper publisher, from a recognized publisher. Yeah. But it came out in the first crypto winter, so it never got distributed in the US, proper distribution, but it was quite a big hit in mm -hmm. the UK, sold a lot of copies. And that other book you can see there, that's Daylight Robbery. That's um, my last book. And that's all about the past and present of taxation mm -hmm. and the future of taxation. And if you're asking me, how do we save the world? Like, I'm all for all the arguments that are going on, all the culture wars, and everyone has to fight their particular battle and all the rest of it. But if you said to me, what are the zero patients? What is patient zero? And by patient zero, I mean, it's a trope of a, a zombie film. Patient right. zero is where the virus starts and mm -hmm. the hero has to get to patient zero and kill him. Or patient zero has got the antidote or he has to kill out patient zero to defeat the virus. And patient zero for me, with everything that's wrong in the world, there are two patient zeros, but they're kind of, there's a big intersection between the two of them. One is our system of money. Mm -hmm. We need independent money. We need a system of money that governments can't create or nobody can create at no cost to itself. Because if one body in a society can create money at no cost to itself and everyone has to work to create it, then you have an imbalanced society straight off the bat. And that's what we've got with fiat money. And two is our system of tax. We don't tax things equally. Our tax system creates inequality because we tax labor, we don't tax capital and all the rest of it. And you design a society the way you tax it. And so tax and money, and there's a, obviously a lot of crossover between the two, but for me, they're patient zero. And I've written two books about money, life after the state and Bitcoin. And, and then I've, I've written Daylight Robbery, which is all about tax. Oh. Hey, everybody, this is Bob Murphy. Thanks for listening to this clip from the Infi podcast. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, please consider subscribing and share this video with others. We've got new episodes dropping every Friday with more insightful discussions. Stay tuned.